There were two brothers who lived in a small town in Mississippi. Their dad lived, had moved to Atlanta. And the, the oldest brother's name was Ben. The youngest son's name was John. Ben was a lifelong follower of Jesus, the oldest. And he gave his life to Jesus early, and he was serious about his walk with Christ. John, however, was a different story. He never gave his life to Christ, and he was his own man, and he had a wild side. And one day, John acted really rashly, and he stole his brother's credit card, and he went to Atlanta. And he racked up a thousands of dollars worth of debt before his brother Ben figured out what was going on and canceled the card. When the money ran out and the credit card was no longer working, at some point, John looked for his dad in Atlanta and found him. And he was desperate. And the father took John in. And while he lived with his dad, his dad led him to the Lord. And John, after all these years of doing his own thing, finally surrendered to King Jesus. He finally accepted the Lord. And with that, John became a new person. John was not the same John he was before Christ. And he knew that what he had done to his brother Ben was wrong and that something needed to be done about it. He knew he, had, he needed to make things right, but he didn't have a job. He had no money. There's no way he could repay Ben these thousands of dollars that he stole from him, and he was afraid. I mean, everybody in town, in that small Mississippi town, knew both brothers, and they knew them for different reasons. Ben was respected. Everybody loved Ben, well-known, well-liked. John was well-known, but he wasn't well-liked, and he was not well-respected. And word had gotten out that he had done this to his brother. So John is afraid to go back to Mississippi. He's afraid of what his, you know what? His brother has every legal right to press charges. John could, could end up in jail if he goes back and tries to make amends with his brother. He doesn't know how his brother's going to respond. His brother may respond with anger and bitterness, and hatred even, and be unforgiving, and call the sheriff. He doesn't know, so he's afraid. He has no money to pay it back. He's afraid of what the townspeople are going to say. He's afraid of what his brother's going to do and say. So there's fear in his heart. But the father loves his sons equally. And it, it breaks his heart to think that his brother's may never speak again. Now, I bet you know maybe somebody you're in your own family, or as Kieran says, your cousins, right? You, maybe you know somebody or you, you're friends with somebody who there, there are brothers or sisters who do not speak anymore. They refuse to talk and call each other in the email. They, just, they don't show up to the same vacation, uh, family uh, holidays. They they just stay apart. Why? Because something happened in the past. And they never got over it. And they hung on. They clung to the bitterness, the rage, the anger, the hatred. And there's unforgiveness. And his father did not want to see his two brothers suffer that. He wanted his brothers to be reconciled and brought together. So what did he do? He put his arm around John. And he just led John to the Lord. John's a new person in Christ. He's convicted in his heart. He, he, he tells John, John, you know what Christ would want you to do. And the Spirit's living in you. You are his ambassador now. You, are, you have to do what Christ would do. We have to live like Christ would live and do the things Christ would do. You know, I know, Dad, I'm not, but I'm afraid. I, look, son, the Lord's going to be with you. I can't, tell you, can't guarantee what your brother Ben's going to do. I, we can't change whether he's angry or not. We can't change his actions if he's going to press charges. I have no power over that, and neither do you. You only have power over what you can do, and you have to do the right thing. I know, Dad. I know, Dad. And he, he puts his arm around Ben, although Ben's way over there, 
And he, he says, he calls Ben. He says, Ben, your brother John's here with me. And he came to Christ. He put Christ on in baptism. He surrenders his life. He's a, he's a different person. Oh, Dad, come on. You and I both know. Let me tell you, Ben, that's true. The Spirit of God has come in him. He's different now. He wants to make amends, but he's afraid. Dad, I don't know. I mean, Dad, he re- I know he hurt you, Ben. It was wrong what he did to you. You have every right to press charges. And I'm not telling you not to press charges. You do what you need to do. But I'm going to send him to you. And I want you to do the right thing. I want you to forgive him. John, I know you're afraid. But God is, wants, to help, wants to help you overcome that fear. Ben, I know you're angry. I know... You're hurt, but the Spirit of God wants you to overcome that. So the father puts his arm around both guys, and he tries to reconcile them in himself. He is the representative. In this situation, the father is Christ in this story. He represents Jesus because his father is the minister of reconciliation. He is the ambassador for Christ. He puts himself in the middle, and he reaches out to both sons, and brings them together. Now, I hope that parable that I just made up really kind of sums up what we're going to talk about when we get to the book of Philemon. So, let's look at just a few scriptures of uh, the beginning of Philemon, and then we'll talk about who is Philemon, okay? All right, here's the first three verses of the book of Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon our dear friend and fellow worker. Also to Aphia, our sister, and Acropus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home, grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. What do we know about Philemon? Philemon lived in the city of Colossae, okay? And we know, we just studied the book of Colossians, which is Paul's letter to the church in Colossae, and we know that... uh, the church is meeting in Philemon's home at this point. Remember we said in the last series that the church in Colossae wasn't some big church that had their own building. It was a simple house church. Guess whose house the church is meeting in? Philemon. Well, we think maybe that this person, uh, greetings to Aphia, our sister, is probably Philemon's wife. And this guy, Archippus, our fellow soldier, is probably their son. We don't know for sure. But he's probably writing to a household of people, and they are hosting this church in their home. That says a whole bunch about this family already, doesn't it? We think that Philemon somehow, let me back up a minute. Do you remember when we talked about Colossians, we said Epaphras was the guy who brought the gospel to Colossae. Epaphras. Somehow Epaphras heard the message from Paul, Maybe Epaphras traveled to a different city, maybe Ephesus where Paul was preaching. And Epaphras heard the gospel, was converted. He took the good news back to Colossae. He started a church. And somehow in there, Philemon also heard the gospel. Maybe he also traveled to Ephesus or some city and heard Paul preaching. And he became converted and came back. Maybe Epaphras brought the gospel back to Colossae. And Philemon heard the gospel from Epaphras there in Colossae. Either way, this guy is a church leader. He's a follower of Christ. He hosts the church in his home, and, he, and he's, a, he's a follower of Christ. He's a, he's a leader in the church. Okay, now we don't know much more about this guy, but we do know that uh, Paul's writing a personal letter to him. There's not many personal letters in the New Testament. There's a few. A lot of them are written to churches. This is written to a man, and to his family. And then this verse, verse 3, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's easy to read that as part of the salutation of the letter because that's kind of formulaic in some ways in Paul's letters. He says something like this in every letter. But I don't don't want to skip over that and skim over it. Paul is about to ask Philemon to do something really difficult really difficult and he knows in order to do this difficult thing he's going to need the grace and peace of god through christ 
It cannot be done without the grace and peace that comes from God through Jesus. So don't skim over that verse 3. That is a serious thing. All right, let's go on to verse 4. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord. Now, let's put a pin right there. That should sound very familiar to you. Remember, Paul is writing the letter to the Colossian church. At the same time, he's writing this letter to Philemon. And those verses are almost identical to verses 3 and 4 in chapter 1 of Colossians. It's the same idea. I always thank God. Remember, we talked about him praying consistently, persistently, continually, right? I always thank God as I remove remembering you in your prayers because i hear about your love for all his holy people and his your faith in the lord jesus there's loyalty to jesus and love for the people those are the two things that gets paul's engine going that lets him know this philemon guy is the real deal he's already heard back about his great love for the people in his church and he's heard back by his loyalty, his faithfulness to Jesus Christ. Paul knows this guy is the real deal. He's a real Christian. And verse 6, I pray that your partnership with us, this word partnership in the Greek is related, it's, it's that koinonia. You've heard me talk about koinonia, that Greek word. It means fellowship, but not a potluck fried chicken fellowship. As part of it, fellowship as in a deep, intimate community of believers who are tied together. And really, koinonia is also a business term that has to do with a business partnership. That's why the word partnership is here. It's both. And when you and I, when we are in deep fellowship, we have koinonia community with each other. We are partners with each other in the business of Jesus. That is why at Cordova Community Church, we don't refer to you as members. Nothing wrong with that term. We call you what? Partners. It's part of what koinonia really is. It's mutual obligation to each other, mutual commitment to each other. So Paul says, man, I thank you for your partnership, Philemon. He's a partner in the business of Jesus. Partnership with us in the faith, may be, I pray that it may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Whoa, what is that? So Paul's goal here is for Philemon and everybody else to really become deeper in our understanding of what it means to follow Christ in every good thing. And the, the partnership with them can actually lead them into more knowledge, not no fact, factual knowledge, but knowing, understanding, uh, accepting, and being part of the greater good that, that Christ is doing. Paul is setting Philemon up here. Not in a bad way. You ever been to a business review and they soften the blows at first and they say, I just want to commend you. Uh, you, you do, you're on time every day. You never leave early. And, uh, you know, you... Uh, when a report's due, you do not miss a deadline. And they, you know, they, they're building you up, and, and you get the feeling, oh, what's coming? <laughs> what's, what shoe's about to drop, all right? Because he never talks to me this way. <laughs> yeah, and that's kind of what Paul's doing. Not in an insincere way. He's very sincere about this. But he is, he's reeling Philemon in with that, remember that outstretched arm for the father? He's pulling Philemon in. He's building him up. He's, he's reminding him of this connection they have, and he's going to have a big ask here in just a minute. Verse 7, your love, imagine Paul just doing this with his arm around him. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the heart, hearts of the Lord's people. You're a great church leader, Philemon, and it, my heart is just overflowing. You're doing a great job. I love it. Keep up the good work. Verse 8. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, because, you know, Paul is an apostle, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is 
none other than Paul, an old man and now a prisoner of Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus. You see what he called Onesimus there? His son, who became my son while he was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful to both you and to me. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Let's keep going. Verse 12. I am sending him who is my very heart back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you would do would not seem forced but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So, Philemon, if you consider me a partner, there's that word again. It's related to koinonia, it's koinonos. A partner, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. Now, Paul didn't always write his own letters. He always, sometimes he had a secretary. He would dictate, right? Now, we don't know if that means Paul wrote this whole letter by himself or at this moment he grabbed the papyrus and, he, and the whatever he's writing with and he said, now I'm writing this, okay? But Paul, some of this is in Paul's own writing. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention, you owe me your very self, which is, he's really mentioning it, is it? And he, he says, don't, don't mention it. Not to mention, but he really is kind of throwing that in there. He's saying, you know what? You would not be where you are today without me. You found, you discovered Christ because I taught you. So you owe me a lot here. You owe me your very life, he says. Verse 20, I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you, some reward from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. So let's talk about these verses. Paul is asking his koinonos, his, his partner in Christ, to do something extraordinary, something very difficult. I don't have time to go into what slavery was like in the first century. It, is, it was nothing like what we know as slavery uh, in, in America and in England and other places in the West in the last few centuries. And that still goes on today in other parts of the world. It was not based on race at all. In fact, all it took was your country to be defeated by another country, and you were slaves. That's all it took. Didn't, it doesn't matter what color your skin are, what your ethnic, ethnicity was. You lost, therefore, they can take you as a slave. Some of the slaves were not that kind of slaves. Some of them were, were just indentured servants. They owed a big debt to pay off the debt. You became a slave in that person's house. Slavery, and some people say, why didn't, Paul, why didn't Paul, and somewhere in this letter, he had the opportunity, or some of the other letters in the New Testament, why didn't he condemn slavery and say it must end right now? And that's a good question. And again, we have to think back of what first century and even ancient times before that were like. That would be kind of like today, making this bold statement that tomorrow we must never, ever again put gas in our cars or use electricity. That's how basic slavery was to the whole entire culture, not just to the wealthy people, but to the whole entire culture. You know, there were problems when we had the Emancipation Proclamation with all these slaves being freed at the same time, not that they were all automatically set free, but there were a lot of, and after the Civil War, there were thousands and thousands of freed slaves who had no idea how to survive. And a lot of them really suffered for it. 
Again, I'm not saying we should have kept slavery. That's exactly the opposite of what I'm saying. But for Paul to say, to lie to stick a dynamite and just try, try to change things overnight would have really been disastrous for everybody. Paul, instead of planting a stick of dynamite, he's planting a time bomb that's going to go off a little bit at a time as people, individual people, individual households, get the idea of what the gospel is really like. And they start to release their slaves and start to free them, start to treat them differently than they ever have before, start to treat them as a brother and a sister who's more like an employee than someone they own. And it's a time bomb that diffuses over time. And guess what? It took a long time, but it happened. And that's Paul's approach here. And we'll see in just a minute the Paul that time bomb. I'm, I'll show you in just a few scriptures how that time bomb is coming out in Paul's message here. So, he said, Onesimus was useful to me, Paul said. He's useful to me. He came to me while I was in prison. He's, been very, he's so dear to my heart. I don't want to let him go. I wish he could stay with me and continue as my fellow worker, as my partner in Christ. He is, in fact, Philemon, he's doing what you would have done if you were. He's your representative, Philemon. He's representing you well because he's serving me. I don't want to let him go. He's very useful. And he says, now I know to you he wasn't very useful. Now, the word Onesimus, the name Onesimus actually means useful. And it was probably a nickname given to Onesimus at one time. It was a common name for slaves, actually. And uh, it was probably, I'm guessing it was given to him kind of with some irony or maybe some satire. Hey, get over here and be helpful, useful. Get off your rear end and come help, useful. Because Paul knows that he was kind of useless to Philemon. But something has changed. Something has changed in this man to drastically change his whole demeanor and his whole lifestyle. Now he is useful. He's living up to his real name. Much less to think that Onesimus ran away from Philemon. That really made him pretty useful, useless to Philemon. And he stole money from Philemon. Remember Paul said, if he's done, if he's done you anything wrong or he owes you anything, charge it to me. He has stolen something in the process of running away. He has wronged Philemon. This is who Onesimus is. And somehow he found Paul in prison. And maybe he had heard about Paul from Philemon and from Epaphras and from the church people. Maybe they've been talking about Paul. They've never met him because Paul never traveled to Colossae that we know of. Maybe he heard that Paul was in prison and he went to find Paul. Maybe. Maybe he just went to the big city to hide. After all, he was an escaped slave. And the penalty was severe for slaves, especially those who stole. You could, the easiest thing uh, was just to be sent back. But you could have been thrown in prison and you could have been killed. And your owner may have insisted on those things. So Onesimus is hiding out in the big city, and it would be easy for him to continue, even after he came to Christ, for him to continue hiding or go to another city and try to hide and blend in. He could have gotten away with it, maybe. But Paul says, no, we've got to make things right. We've got to make things right. Because he's no longer a slave, he's a dear brother. He calls him his son. Philemon is Paul's son, and Onesimus is now Paul's son. Paul has two sons in the faith from the same household who are separated from each other, who are not talking, who are, there's animosity here between these two brothers. What's Paul going to do? And then Paul says this. In verse 16, he said, Perhaps the reason he was separated from you, Philemon, for a while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. Hmm. 
I think that's a time bomb right there. I think Paul is laying the groundwork for something that is even more radical than Philemon accepting on us and us back. He's going to accept him back as his brother. Something more precious than the relationship has ever seen. This reminds me, this verse reminds me of that scene in Genesis. You know, Joseph has been in Egypt. He's now the second most powerful man in Egypt. And there's famine in the land, and all Joseph's, Joseph's family, his brothers come, and they're begging for food. And then they find out, whoops, this is Joseph, the guy we mistreated, the guy we sold into slavery. He's the most second powerful man in Egypt. And they bow down, and they're like, oh, oh, we had, oh, I'm sorry, we're sorry, we're sorry. And Joseph says this. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. As, as Joseph, Joseph reconciled to his brothers, he's reconciled to his brothers, he gets a glimpse of this, this bigger picture, this upper story of what God is doing. And I think Paul has this bigger picture. He understands the upper story. That while they see, Philemon and Onesimus Onesima see this, the, the, the problem at hand, Paul sees the bigger picture. That maybe... Maybe, perhaps, God is working in this terrible situation to do something good, to bring brothers together in Christ that he would have never done otherwise. I'm also reminded, we sang this song a few minutes ago, Pierce My Ear, that Candace and Mark led us in. I love that song. That song comes, comes straight out of Exodus 21. In Exodus 21, it says Hebrews, talk about Hebrew slaves, Hebrews who have Hebrews as slaves, that after six years they had to release them because it was the year of the seventh year, right? The Sabbath year. All slaves, if they were Hebrew slaves, had to be released. And Paul and Exodus says, But when you release that slave, who was in the Hebrew times, uh, it was an indentured servant. It wasn't a, Hebrew, a slave for life, anything. It was an indentured servant who owed you money. If you release that slave and he says, you know what? My, my owner, my master treated me so well. I was part of the family. I don't want to leave. I want to, I want to stay and work for him. If he says that, you go before the judges, and then, the, then you come back to your master's house. He takes you to the doorpost. He takes an awl and a hammer and he pierces your ear as a sign that you belong to him forever. The two of you belong together forever. This is what Exodus 21, verses 5 and 6 say. But if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children and do not want to go free, then his master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door of the, or the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl. Then he will be his servant for life. This is what reminds me here. Paul is sending him back, wants to send him back, not just as a slaver, a slave, but as a brother for life. You may have him back forever. And I think this, this word here has a double meaning. I think it means eternity, that you will be brothers forever now, and permanently in this life, you're going to be the same household. Because you're going to be brothers and you're going to be partners, not just in the work of the household. You're going to be partners in the work of Jesus. This is a good deal. Big deal. So like the parable I told you at the beginning, here's Paul in the middle. He's got his spiritual son Onesimus. He's got his spiritual son Philemon. He brought both to the Lord. And now they're away from each other. And Paul speaks words of encouragement to Onesimus. He says, I know you're afraid. But you know what God says, be strong, be courageous, do not be afraid. The Lord goes with before you. You can do this in the power of the spirit that now lives in you. I, no, I can't guarantee what Philemon's going to do. He may still press charges, Onesimus. You may still go to jail. You could lose your life. But this is the right thing to do. What would Jesus have you do? I could run away and hide. I know you could run away and hide, but is that what Jesus would want you to do? And he pulls in with this letter, he pulls in Philemon. And he says, Philemon, man, you're a great leader in the church. 
your love for the people, your loyalty to Jesus. I know about these things. Everybody knows about these things. And it refreshes my heart. It gives me such joy to see you in action, see what the Lord is doing to you. I have a big favor to ask. Onesimus, I know he ran away from you. I know he stole from you. But he's with me now. And Christ has totally changed him. I'm, I'm serious. He has. I want you to take him back. I know, Philemon, man, you don't want to do that because you're angry. He hurt you. He hurt your heart. He hurt your pocketbook. He hurt your pride. I'm asking you, Philemon, to set aside your pride and in humility take him back and forgive him. That's a big ask for both these guys, isn't it? That is a huge, big ask. i got to be careful how I say big ask. <laughs> it is a huge, big ask to ask these guys to do this. But it's the will of God. It's what it means to follow Christ. When we follow Christ, it's not an easy path always. And he asks us to do difficult things, things that we don't want to do. It would be so much easier for these two guys to keep going in the direction they're going. So much easier for Onesimus to slip away and hide, maybe go to a totally different city and blend in and start a new life and to leave his old life behind. So, so much easier for Philemon to press charges, to try to get his money back, to hold on to a grudge or, or that bitterness or that hatred. So much easier. Christ asks us to walk a different path. Not the path of ease and comfort. I think the basic message of this letter to Philemon is this idea of reconciliation. And it reminds me of what Paul said in a different letter in 2 Corinthians. He said this, So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. That says it all right there. Because he's telling these two brothers, his two, his two spiritual sons, don't think like the world thinks because you've been changed. You have a Jesus point of view now. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? A new creature. The new creature has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who what? reconciled to us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the message of, that Paul wants to give to Philemon and Onesimus. Jesus, on the cross, outstretched, re, built a bridge between God and humanity. And he reconciled humanity with God. It was a vertical bridge. And on that cross, Jesus stretches out his arms. And he is building a bridge from one another to one another. And he wants to reconcile us to Christ, to God. And he wants to reconcile us into one family of God. Not only that, he has made us ministers of reconciliation. Just as, Christ, as Paul was acting as Christ's representative by bringing these two brothers together, God wants us to act as Christ's representatives, to step into the fray, to step in the middle, to reach around this brother, reach around this brother, to speak gospel sense to them and do our best to bring them together. Is that easy? Absolutely not. It is scary. It is difficult, and it is risky. It's risky for all parties involved. 
It's risky for someone like Onesimus, who is going to, he doesn't know if he's safe if he goes back to Colossae. He has no idea if his safety is guaranteed. He may be it put in himself, putting himself in harm's way. Is it safe? Is it easy for Philemon? No, absolutely not. You and I know when we've been hurt, we want to hang on to that hurt. We want to, with closed fist, say, no, my rights have been damaged. My rights have been stepped on. I, no, absolutely not. Am I going to forgive? No way. And that feels good to us, doesn't it? To hang on to that hatred, that bitterness. It's not the way of Christ. It's the way of the world. It's difficult for both parties. It's difficult if you're in the middle and you're trying to bridge that gap because you risk losing both people as friends. You risk both of them being angry with you and walking away. There's risk involved no matter where you stand in this situation. But you know what? There's somebody who took a much bigger risk, and that is Christ. And he gave up safety. He gave up comfort. And he took the risk. He paid the price because of love. Because of love. For God so loved the world that he gave Christ. Right? So that all who believe him shall have eternal life. So, in these situations, if you're in the middle, we have to ask ourselves, well, do I love God? Am I truly a follower of Christ? If you are, then you are automatically a minister of reconciliation. Your job, your partner in the business of Jesus, in your job description. Just like it's in these two people's job description to forgive and to confess, to repent and to love. To get rid of fear, set aside fear, to set aside pride. These are in our job descriptions as partners, as koinos in the gospel of Jesus. And he ends his letter with these verses. And one more thing, Philemon, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. He, he opened this letter up by saying, Philemon, I pray for you all the time. I give thanks for you. And now he says, I know you've been praying for me too. And you've been praying for us to be able to come together. So get a room ready. It's my desire soon to come to Colossae. We don't know if Paul ever made it to Colossae or not. Get a room ready. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. These are some, some of the same names he closed out the book of Colossians with. And if you missed last week's sermon, the last sermon in the Colossians, no, two weeks ago when Matt Carter preached, you need to go back to YouTube or Facebook and find that sermon and watch it because he, he took all these names and it was a really good uh, way of presenting that. And I, I feel like I skipped something, so I'm going to back up real quick. I'm confident in your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. What do you think that means? He's asking Philemon to take Onesimus back into his household and to forgive his debts. And Paul said, I'll even pay the debt. If he's, if he's wronged you, if he's stolen from you, put it on my, I'll pay it. Then he says, I'm confident that you're going to do what I'm asking and even more than I'm asking. What do you think that means? What do you think Philemon reads into this when he reads this letter? I'll tell you what I think. I think Paul is laying a time bomb. I think he's saying, you know what I really want you to do, Philemon. I really want you to free this man. Don't just forgive him. Free him. His debt is paid. Christ paid his debt. You're brothers now. You are brothers in the Lord. He's useful to me. He's no longer useless. He could be useful to you too. I write you knowing that you'll even do even more than I ask, that you'll take him back 
forever, no longer as a slave, better than a slave, the brother. Now, we all find ourselves in one of these situations at any time someone is going to wrong you someone's going to do you wrong if they haven't yet they will and it may happen regularly someone's going to hurt your feelings someone's going to offend you someone's going to stomp on your rights and likely your first reaction is going to be either hurt or anger Pride is going to raise its ugly head. It's going to happen. You may be in a situation right now where you're dealing with this. Someone has hurt you. They have stomped on your rights, and you're kind of separated from them. There's some animosity between you. It's uncomfortable, right? Maybe you avoid them. Maybe, maybe you're staying at home online today because you don't want to come here and face somebody who's here in person. Maybe it's somebody at work, and you see them walk into the break room, and you turn around and go the other way, and say, I'll go to the break room later. Maybe it's somebody in your own house. Could that be possible, that you're avoiding somebody in your own house because they hurt you, because they made you angry? It's going to happen. And you know what? You're also going to be in that spot of Onesimus where you did somebody wrong. You said the wrong thing. You hurt their feelings with your words. You were too quick to react to a situation. Or maybe even something more drastic than these scenarios. And you're going to find yourself also in Paul's position in the middle. And you got friends on either side who aren't talking to each other. Or maybe they're relatives on, in your family and they're not talking to each other. And it breaks your heart to see this. We have lessons to learn from this little letter. Because we are, in, at one time or another, we're in all three of these positions. Am I right? So the question in every situation is, what does Jesus want me to do? But it's risky. Yeah, it is. I don't know what's going to happen. No, you don't. But I'm afraid. I know. Christ is the answer to all these things. All these things, because in Christ, He is the bridge between heaven and earth. And through Christ, we have the power of God in our lives to help us do anything that we need, should and need to do. And in Christ, we had this bridge between each other. It's not up to us. It's not up to us for the results. We are the ministers of reconciliation. We are the ambassadors for Christ. We leave the results up to Christ. We are simply doing his job as we have koinonia, as we partner with Jesus, with the Spirit, with God, with one another in the business of Jesus. Maybe you're in that situation in one of these spots right now, and you're, you're trying to decide, how do I handle it? What do I do? I need prayers. Well, here we go. This is time. We're here to pray for you. We're here to hear something. If you need to say something out loud, I'll be right over here out, out these doors. You can easily just kind of walk over there with Candace and Mark are going to come and reset their microphones that I moved. Y'all come on up. And uh, during this song, I'll be over there. Feel free to come and pray with us. In a few minutes, we'll have open mic time. If somebody wants to share something that's on their heart, you can Feel free to do that as well.